I want to start with my good friend and the chief of our pediatric cardiology division, uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Sklansky, who is going to talk to us about the importance of early detection um, of congenital heart disease. He is a world-renowned um, pediatric cardiologist specializing in fetal imaging and fetal echocardiography, and it's my pleasure to have him uh, come up and uh, speak to you. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank Jamil again and Pam for putting together such a phenomenal uh, symposium. Looking forward to both days. The, uh, um, it's a pleasure to be here with my esteemed colleagues and friends from the community as well, and uh, um, to be able to give this short talk um, on um, the importance and challenge of early detection. Of course, as Joe, uh, Jamil quoted uh, Joe Perloff's prophetic words about the importance of doing everything we can t for not just uh, survival, but quality of life. And I think so much of uh, both, uh, both survival and quality of life can be traced back to the beginnings. Of course, even we know now maternal nutrition and so on can impact the development of adult onset disease, but likewise, the way we identify heart disease, how early we identify heart disease, I think makes a great impact in terms of uh, the numbers and the quality of life of those people who reach adulthood that all of you take care of. So this will be a short sort of overview of, of that whole area of prenatal detection. Don't have any disclosures, unfortunately. So sort of preaching to the choir, the importance of congenital heart disease. So. Um, Heart disease occurs in about one and out of 1% of babies, maybe more if you include uh, bicuspid aortic valve, small muscular VSDs, and so it's very common, as you know. And the incidence, though, of critical forms of congenital heart disease, these are the ones really that will be taken by that we as a community, that you as a community of adult congenital heart specialists will take care of. Those are really critical forms of heart disease that require surgery during the first year of life. That's still three out of 1,000 babies, live-born babies. That's a, that's a pretty big number. Um, by far and away, heart disease accounts for the, is the ma most common form of major birth defect of, uh, of any kind. And congenital heart disease accounts for about 40% of deaths from congenital anomalies of all kinds. Now, and this, is, this is the important consideration, the importance of early detection, that most childhood deaths from congenital heart disease, as well as preventable morbidity, from congenital heart disease occur usually in the first hours, days, or weeks of life. And it's usually from missed or delays, delays in diagnosis. That's the key. So it's really important to pick up heart disease early on. So imagine, instead of going through all the data in 10 minutes, why don't you imagine if you were going to be born with congenital heart disease, if you were going to be born with hypoplastic left heart, would you rather, be, would you rather know about it before birth? Or would you rather your mother find out about it after birth? I think all of us here know and I think Dr. Reamson will be talking about hypoplastic left heart. Well, many of us will be talking about major forms of disease, including hypoplastic left heart. It's sort of clear. I would certainly want to know about it early. We want to be, you know, come to the OR in the best shape possible at the right time, and that could only be done if we know about the disease ahead of time. And that's the good set of hypoplastic left heart. What if you're, what if you're un unfortunate and you have uh, hypoplastic left heart with a restrictive foramenal valley, like this case here? then you certainly want to be, know about it, because if you're not delivered at a center that can take care of this right away, your, your chances of survival and relatively intact survival are, are relatively close to zero. So here's a, here you could see this is a patient with hypoplastic left heart syndrome who uh, uh, had a restrictive atrial septum, underwent a placement of a stent soon after birth because we knew about the diagnosis. We were delivered in the right place. We didn't waste time doing the wrong things, and, we, and the baby, we were able to decompress the left atrium, decompress the lungs, and go to the OR in a better shape. Let's say you were born with transposition. Would you rather know about it beforehand or after birth? Clearly, we'd want to know about it after, uh, beforehand. In some cases, particularly those of us who were born with transposition with intact ventricular septum may need a balloon atrial septostomy. This is a case of showing the balloon going across the atrial septum. If we don't know about this ahead of time, the chances of an intact long-term survival are much less. What about coarctation of the aorta? This is a, those of you who are involved, very few of you, but some of you are involved with prenatal detection. Um, coarctation is a tough diagnosis to make. It's a tough diagnosis to make even after birth, let alone prenatally, but it makes a huge difference. Coarctation of the aorta, as you know, prognosis is very good if we know about it, but 
but unfortunately, a lot of time we miss it, not just prenatally, but postnatally. Ray Chang, many of you know Ray Chang, that runs the pediatric cardiology program at Harbor, when he was here at UCLA, evaluated all these babies who um, died in California with died of congenital heart disease that was missed until death. So these babies died, and most of these babies, uh, uh, um, the median age of death was less than two weeks of age. So they, they died young, but missed diagnosis. What were the most common diagnoses? Hypoplastic left heart and co-rotation of the aorta. So emphasizing the importance of early detection, uh, even of, of lesions such as co-rotation. So the fact is, 2013, I guess that's four years ago, Maths, right? That we, there was, it was a big step forward in terms of prenatal detection because it used to be that the obstetricians who do the anatomic survey at mid gestation, like 20 weeks, needed just to look at the four chamber view. And then the outflow tracks were added to our guidelines in North America that the uh, anatomic survey had to include the outflow tracks. That was a big step forward. And the same year, it was decided that um, we were going to start using, um, mandating the use of pulse oximetry screening to detect critical forms of congenital heart disease before babies, newborns, would leave the hospital. So those are big steps forward. Um, there are some problems, though, with detecting heart disease after birth. First of all, physical exam, which is very important, of course. We teach this to our, to our students and residents. Wren and colleagues found that, and many others around the world have found, that the routine neonatal exam fails to detect more than half of babies with heart disease, which is hard to believe. But it is true. The ductus stays open. By the time babies are go home, often the duct is still open. And a lot of these ma even major forms of heart disease, as many of you know, are missed and go home. And, uh, and, and let's say you do detect it at second day of life before the baby goes home. A lot of time, that delay, those 48 hours, uh, there may have been physiologic compromise that may have long-term impact, even in terms of uh, how, what that baby's life is going to be like when the baby reaches your care in adulthood. Now, of course, now with pulse oximetry screening, we're much better after birth detecting heart disease. Um, it's interesting that um, Maley's study is a meta-analysis that was published in circulation in 2009. I found it interesting. This is a really great study that showed that there was not enough data to support the use of pulse oximetry. That was less than 10 years ago. Now, of course, we all know that it's a great thing, and it's adding a lot to in terms of the ability to detect heart disease before a child leaves the hospital. And now we, now we have pulse oximetry throughout most of the country. It's mandated. Every hospital with newborns needs to provide this. Um, but, of course, even with pulse oximetry screening, which is usually done just before discharge, because if you do it too early, there's too many false positives, that, again, you're going to be, uh, even that short delay to the time the pulse oximetry is done may lead to physiologic compromise that may have preventable, uh, introduced preventable morbidity. So bottom line is my point, of course, is that if you're going to choose, it's much better to pick up heart disease prenatally than the postnatal. It's better to pick up heart disease in the hospital before you go home, but even better still would be to pick up heart disease before birth. Why is this so important? Well, because first, because the, one of the not only can we um, um, impact the postnatal natural history. If some cases of heart disease, if we pick up prenatally, we can actually do something about. We can treat with an antiarrhythmics. Some cases of aortic stenosis, we can treat in utero to prevent the development of hypoplastic left heart. Um, but most, probably the biggest benefit to prenatal detection is that we can optimize delivery. We know where and when and how to deliver these babies so that when they're born, if they're born with hypoplastic left heart with a restrictive atrial septum, they'll be born in the right place and we avoid the delays in diagnosis that may occur even if we detect heart disease with pulse oximetry or physical exam a day or two after delivery. So, now that we know how important congenital heart disease is and how important it is to detect heart disease early, preferably prenatally, how good are we? How good are we at picking up heart disease prenatally? This was a great study by Quartermain that was published in 2015 looking at um, the SDS database, so major forms of heart disease requiring surgery um, early on, and looking at how many of these babies are detected prenatally across the country. And this was relatively recent data. And now we could see how we're doing. We all get grades. Different parts of the country gets our grades. So how, what percentage of major disease are detected in our region? 31%. So chances are far, you know, two-thirds of babies with major forms of heart disease delivered in this part of the country are still being missed prenatally. We're better than the South, I guess, but uh, 
here a little bit better, but even in the best part of the country, it's less, the chances are more likely than not, if you have any form of major heart disease, it's gonna be missed prenatally, which is just crazy given the, 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 how critical it is to pick how common heart disease is and how critical, what big a difference it makes to pick up heart disease prenatal and the ability that just with extra training, it's possible to improve these numbers. This is just some examples. If you look, it, TAPVR, of course, very deaf, only 10% detected prenatally. But even arch obstruction like COARC, 21%, aortic stenosis, just a quarter of them, even tetralogy, transposition, even an AV canal, uh, less than 50%. Um, and the outflow tracks are more difficult to pick up than four chamber views. So still pretty bad, which means we have a lot of uh, Im uh, improvement that, ahead of us that we can do. Um, I've been very um, passionate about Im the importance of improving our cardiac screening guidelines because we're not doing well enough. If you look, the AIUM is American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine. How am I doing time-wise? Uh, North America guidelines, the ISWA, is International Society of Ultrasound and Obstetrics and Gynecology, is sort of more international. And we have been behind the European guidelines in terms of any the low-risk pregnancy comes in for the anatomic survey. What do what does the obstetrician or the perinatologist or the sonographer need to do at that time to pick up heart disease? Clips were not required, core flow was not acquired, three vessel view not required, and and angle of acquisition and scanning techniques to optimize image quality, which is a personal um, for me, I think this is really a key area that we've been overlooking, the importance not just of getting images, just getting a clip like a like a check, 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 but actually getting a nice quality image. Um, that's been overlooked. And even in, in ISWAG and around the world, that has been. So I think there's areas for improvement. We've now included the outflow tracks, uh, but we need to include a so-called three-vessel view, um, include clips and color flow, even in low-risk pregnancies. And we've published this just, uh, I guess, last year. What are we and our guidelines doing wrong? We emphasize the importance of good image quality and proper angles of acquisition. We know this. All of us who do echocardiography after birth recognize the importance of image quality and the way you do it and the art dropout and so on. But that hasn't been taught as much, I think, to sonographers who evaluate the fetus. And part, that's particularly important with cardiac imaging. And I think the guidelines have not addressed that sufficiently. So I think that's an area we can really, if we emphasize that, to our colleagues will be able to improve detection rates significantly. Now, of course, our pa your patient population, adults with congenital heart disease, when your patients get pregnant, that's, they should not just undergo a screening cardiac ultrasound, of course, because those fetuses, every fetus born to a woman with congenital heart disease is going to be at increased risk uh, for congenital heart disease um, as well. So this is a, uh, the AHA scientific statement just came out. It's a great comprehensive review, if any of you haven't seen it. This came out in 2014, and in this uh, scientific statement, there's one paragraph that talks about maternal cardiac disease and fetal echocardiography. And I'll just read it to you, it's short. But the risk of recurrence um, for non-dysmorphic, -chro non non-chromosomal heart disease is about twice the times as high if the mother is affected versus the father um, or the sibling. But of course, if the father is affected, then the baby is also at risk. And the risk varies, of course, with the type of heart defects, like transposition is going to be less than AV canal. And the highest rates appear to be heterotaxy and AV canal defects at about 10 to 14 percent risk of recurrence, or aortic stenosis or left-sided obstructive lesions in the mother. For some reason, we're still learning why. It's fascinating. There's so much more to learn about why this is the case, but we can just describe what we see. The risk of recurrence for left side of obstructive lesions in the mother is extremely high, maybe up to 20 percent. Um, and so overall, majority of, for the majority, they say of maternal cardiac diagnosis, the risk of recurrence is in a range of 3 to 7 percent. So we often will quote around 3 to 4 percent, 5 percent, depending on the lesion. Um, but transposition is, is, does seem to be less commonly, has, recurs much less. If the mother has transposition, probably less likely for recurrence. And when there is recurrence of heart disease, it seems to be about half the time the same type of lesion, and the other half the time different. We're still just describing what we see. We still have a lot, of, lot, of, um, lot to learn in terms of why we're seeing what we're seeing. Uh, they mentioned here tetralogy of flow is low recurrence rate. I, that hasn't been our experience, uh, I think. Um, Tetralogy flow has significant recurrence rates. But the bottom line is, though, a fetal echo is indicated if, if there is any form of maternal congenital heart disease. So those um, women need to undergo not just screening 
for heart disease of their fetus, but detailed fetal echocardiography. And there are some difference. Some, there are some differences in the guide, what the guidelines say if it's a low-risk pregnancy or a high-risk pregnancy. All of the pregnancies that, that we take care of, that you take care of as adult subspecialists, should undergo fetal echo. Now, if you look, here's the AIUM and ISWAG and this American Heart Guidelines. Uh, all of them require clips, all of them require color flow, all of them require looking at all the valves, outflows, and the three-vessel view. But again, angle of acquisition, scanning techniques, uh, not mentioned, all, um, not emphasized as much as I think they need to be emphasized, even in the guidelines for fetal echo. And actually, there are some studies showing that in certain, some people's hands, not certainly not around here, but there's not complete um, congruence between what the fetal echocardiogram says and then what's found after birth. In other words, sometimes heart disease is being missed even if a formal fetal echo is done. And I think this is part of the reason why we need to emphasize image quality and angle of acquisition as well as these other elements. So the secrets, don't tell anyone. This is what I think we should be doing. You need to look at the beating four chamber view, the outflow tracks, the beating three vessel. I say beating because a lot of people still, when they screen the fetal heart, uh, not so much when they're doing fetal echo, but for low risk pregnancies, they just do clip, they just do still frame images. And this is like back in the dark ages when we didn't have packs, we, it was so difficult to store. Now that's not the case, so there's really no excuse. Color Doppler is important, even for low risk pregnancies, even though it's not part of the guidelines. We need to incorporate sweeps. Pediatric cardiologists, adult cardiologists, when we're trained in echo, we know. Um, I have a red light, I'm almost done. We know that uh, we don't just do a clip, we want to do a sweep. We want to see how one part of the heart is, is related to the next part. If DORV, we can't just do one, one, one clip, we need to show how the AV, how the VSD is related to the aortas, so that sort of thing. And then angle of acquisition image quality needs to be emphasized far more than it has been in the guidelines. So to, to finish up, um, take home points. So, uh, First, and this is just from my talk, it's going to be a phenomenal day, days, next day, couple of days, but congenital heart disease, of course, major public health concern, very common. Prenatal detection of heart disease matters. Every pregnant woman with congenital heart disease should undergo formal fetal echocardiography, and that could be at 18, 20 weeks, or we, could, we can look earlier, we can as early as 12 or 13 weeks transvaginally if there's an indication to do so. Then, sorry about that, then optimal, but the bottom, bottom line, and this is, this is probably the most important element, is that optical, fetal, and neonatal and long-term outcomes stem from a collaboration of multiple subspecialists, fetal, adult subspecialists, and pediatric, and coordinated delivery plans with a long-term perspective, thinking that we want to deliver to you guys, um, not only patients who have survived childhood, but who have survived as close to intact, as close to intact survival as possible. So that, I encourage you to come. Those of you who haven't visited us at UCLA, the adult congenital program, I'm sure Jamil would love to have you visit there, as well as us in the fetal program and the pediatric cardiology program. Thank you.